want to welcome you today. It's, uh, it's the 31st, and it's the Latvian Evangelical Lutheran Church. This uh, day of Pentecost, I welcome you all to our service today. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us prepare our hearts for worship. In you, Lord my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame. But shame will come to those who are treacherous without cause. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Father God, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you, Lord, that we can gather this way when, uh, when all else is preventing us from getting it together, but we can still gather together. Lord, I ask you to open our hearts as we sit in our homes and, and worship you. Open our hearts to receive truth. Open our hearts, Lord, to invite you in. We ask, Lord, that all we do will be to your glory and to your honor and your praise through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Melt me. Scripture reading for today, for Pentecost, is the story of Pentecost from Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in their own tongues, in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews, and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. So this, no, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, 
blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's the story of Pentecost. The disciples, all believers, received power. And we're going to sing about that in our Latvian hymn, Duod mum spak agaro dievs, hymn number 132. The first verse reads like this. God, give us the spirit of power. Make your congregation strong. And no matter what the changes, may it stand like a rock. No matter what storms or wars want to destroy it and scatter it to the winds. Spirit, that you change us mightily in a change that you yourself describe as being born again. And all that we do is in the power of your Holy Spirit. The fact that we understand your word, understand it and know how to apply it and have the courage and the strength to apply it is by the power of your Holy Spirit. Bless this sermon with your Holy Spirit, Lord, as Jerry is speaking and as we are listening. Give us ears to hear. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Our gospel reading today comes from the book of John, chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this, he met the spirit whom whom those who believed in him would later receive. Up to that time, the spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. This is the word of the Lord. 
The festival mentioned here in this passage from John is uh, the Festival of Tabernacles. This is a celebratory festival. It's a festival of harvest time. Uh, in this, it's a seven day long festival. And during this time, people would build tabernacles, tents, uh, outside their houses. And they would live in those tents during this time as a remembrance of their time in the desert between being delivered from Egypt and being brought into the promised land. It's a very joyous time that is happening here. And people from all over uh, would come to this festival. It's one of the festivals you find um, that are uh, required in the Old Testament. You can find it in Leviticus 23 if you're interested. Um, it's a fascinating festival. But during this festival, Jesus is, is at the temple teaching. During uh, Jesus' time, uh, this festival... Uh, was characterized by the daily bringing of water from the pool of Siloam. They would fill up a golden urn with water from the pool and they would bring it into the temple and they would pour the water at the base of the altar and at the other side of the altar they would pour wine at the same time. Um, and these signified to them uh, the, the provision of God in the desert, of providing water for them in the desert. Um, it also, the wine signified their deliverance into the promised land. So it was a very festive time. And it was a, it was a time of great celebration. Uh, you find in Isaiah 12, 3, Therefore, you will joyously draw water from the springs of salvation. And Isaiah 44, 3 says, For I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring, my blessing on your descendants. John wants us to see that uh, Jesus himself is a fulfillment of this festival. You will discover as you study these festivals uh, in, the, in the Old Testament that all of them are foreshadows. They're all uh, indicators of, of Christ to come. And this festival is one of them, and John particularly wants us to see that Jesus fulfills this. Um, you remind me, remember that John opened his gospel by saying that uh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word is actually the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. So John again is, is drawing us to this festival as a fulfillment of the prophecy that Jesus is, is the Messiah and Jesus is coming to deliver us. Paul tells us that Jesus is the rock that supplied Israel with water in the barren desert. He's also the bread of life, the fulfillment of the manna that sustained Israel in the wilderness. So now on the last day of this feast, Jesus claims to be the source of living water to all who will come to him and drink. In other words, he's telling people that he is fulfilling this feast. The water ceremony, pouring ceremony, took place for seven days. This is a seven day long festival um, and it's followed by an eighth day of uh, a, a, a holy convocation, if you will, a, a, a celebration of the celebration. Um, there's some question with scholars on whether Jesus made his statement on the seventh day of the festival or on this eighth day when no water was actually brought from the pool of Siloam. Uh, in either way, Jesus is proclaiming that if you thirst for spiritual things, that he's the one that can supply that, that he's offering living water that will never, ever dry up. John explains that by this he meant the spirit. You may remember the last verse in, in our passage in the gospel today. By this he means the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, 
the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. This promise that Jesus made at the Festival of Tabernacles was kept on Pentecost. Uh, Pentecost also, I find this interesting, Pentecost is also a harvest festival, but it's the first harvest of the year. Uh, the first harvest of the year, they brought in the barley crop, then they planted the wheat crop, and then at the end of the year, they would have the Festival of Tabernacles when they brought in the wheat crop. So both of these festivals are actually uh, celebratory things. They're happy events, and both of them have to do with bringing in the crop, with uh, bringing in uh, the fruit of the fields. On that Pentecost day, as, as we saw in our reading from John or from Acts 2 today, all the disciples were radically changed. <coughs> Before Pentecost, they were ordinary men, not a great deal different than you and I. They were fishermen, not scholars. You remember people said, aren't these Galileans? Which was their way of saying, aren't these laborers? uneducated men, how can they do what they're doing? Uh, because they're, they were much like us, not particularly educated in religious things, hadn't been to seminary or the rabbinical schools. And like us, they were often a bit bumbling in their testimony. At times, they, they seemed that they couldn't help but do the wrong thing, say the wrong thing, think the wrong thing, we see that they panicked in the face of danger. They kept having a difficult time catching what Jesus was really talking about. He continually had to ask them, why don't you see? Why can't you understand? They had a little sense of power, and they definitely didn't think that they could feed 5,000 people with the, with the lunch of a little boy. But Jesus took care of that. And uh, they they found that Jesus could actually doing that. But unfortunately, like Peter walking on water, they kept taking their eyes off Christ. And whenever we do that, we, like Peter, begin to sink. Almost never were they praised by Jesus. I don't know if you realize that, but when you read the Gospels, Jesus doesn't often praise these 12 men. Um, he is continually asking them, where's your faith? Have you been with me so long that you still don't get it? Um, it must have been a bit frustrating for them uh, because he kept asking over and over again, where's your faith? Why don't you see this? But sadly, at this point, they didn't get it. They continue to make strange, strange decisions like the time they told the little kids to get out of the way. We don't want any children around here. And Jesus had to rebuke them. Um, they rebuked him. They rebuked Jesus for talking about the cross. And Jesus, in turn, had to rebuke them for trying to convince him not to do what God is calling him to do. They were afraid. They ran away when he was arrested. Peter even denied even knowing him. All of them were hiding from the authorities. They were in fear. And yet after Pentecost, things are completely different. Something dramatic happened at Pentecost. They no longer flinched in the face of danger. They were bold. They stood up. They were true to the one they had previously denied knowing. They were constant now. They were committed. They were dedicated. When they were arrested and told to quit doing what they were doing, they said, whatever is right in the sight of God, to give heed to you rather than God, you be the judge, for we cannot stop speaking what we have seen and heard. That's from Acts 4. They were filled with joy even in the face of, of terrible suffering. They lived lives that were vibrant. 
They lived lives that were a testimony to Jesus. They went all over the world boldly proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. They labored tirelessly, loving not only their friends, but even their enemies. They were willing to die for the cause of Christ. They were men of great wisdom and great stability. And in Acts Acts chapter 2, we see that Peter gave a sermon that day that was so powerful that 3,000 people accepted Christ. People from all over the world were there. Uh, As you may recall, that long list um, that Martin read in in chapter 2 about where all these people were from, people from all over the world were standing there that day and accepted the message of the gospel. That wasn't because Peter was such a great speaker. It was, however, because the Holy Spirit had now come. The Holy Spirit had descended on those disciples, and the Holy Spirit was also there to open the hearts of those who were hearing that message. For that, after all, is the primary purpose of the Holy Spirit, to witness to the divinity of the Son of God. These, uh, these men were untrained. And at the beginning, people didn't really want to pay attention to them because they were untrained. They were busy looking at the outer, the outer circumstances of these men. But the words they had to say under the power of the Holy Spirit were undeniably strong and powerful. And they changed the world because of it. They, recognized, they were recognized by those who um, persecuted them as being very much like Jesus. They weren't just saying they were followers of Jesus. They were actually saying that they were acting like Jesus. Um, That's amazing to me that in just such a short period of time, these men who, who ran away in fear when Jesus was arrested are now standing boldly before the very people who arrested Jesus and are saying, we can't stop talking about him. This is, this is a message from God, and no matter what you say or threaten to do to us, or in fact do to us, we will continue to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. They seem to be totally without fear. It seems to be something strange going on here with these, these men, and it's not just uh, the 12. Uh, there were 120 followers uh, that received this uh, blessing of the, of, the, uh, of the Holy Spirit, including the women who followed Jesus too. So this was going on everywhere. These followers of Jesus, uh, we, we tend to track, because, because the Bible tracks, we tend to track the, the 12 disciples. But uh, the fact is that all of, all of these uh, people who had received the Holy Spirit were now boldly standing up for the message of Christ. The whole community of Christ followers was transformed that day, that day of Pentecost. Everyone kept feeling this sense of awe, this this sense of wonder at what had happened to them. This coming of the Holy Spirit had made such a difference in their lives that They couldn't help but move forward and do the work of God. They even began selling their property so they could help those in need. Uh, They were so transformed that everything they did, they did to the glory of God. They met constantly. They studied the scriptures. They listened to the teaching of the apostles. Um, They helped each other. They They helped those around them. Even in the... Uh, face of great persecution, they continued to do this. They praised God. And because they did, they ended up having favor with a great many of the people. The religious leaders of the day weren't very happy about them, but the people around them uh, were amazed at what they were doing. And because of that, the church continued to grow. So where are we? We have this two groups of people. 
we had these disciples before Pentecost and we had the disciples after Pentecost. Which group are we in? Which group do we identify ourselves with? The disciples for before Pentecost who were timid and shy and a little bit afraid or even a great deal afraid. I don't know about you, but all too often I'm more like the disciples before Pentecost. There are too many times in my life when I have to keep learning the same lesson over and over again. It seems like Jesus is telling me, when are you going to get it? Where's your faith? I feel like those disciples many times before Pentecost. I frequently have little sense of God's power in my life. There are many, many times when I feel um, lost. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to serve God. I keep worrying about my earthly position. I will confess to you that I'm as guilty of pride as any man, and there are times when I worry about what people think about me. I'd like to say I only care about what God thinks about me. The truth is, many times, I fail in that. Many times, I'll confess to you, at night, I fall asleep while I'm praying. I'm not very proud of that, but it is a fact. I'm more like the disciples before Pentecost, I think, than I am the disciples after Pentecost. Many times I don't know what to say to people when I have an opportunity to share the gospel with them. I see this great chasm between me and what I ought to be. At times I wonder why I'm on this side of the chasm and not on that side. What is it going to take? These disciples who changed the world were no better men than we are. They weren't smarter. They weren't better educated. They weren't more naturally talented. There's certainly no indication that this group of men were, were gifted speakers or charismatic. Uh, there's nothing to indicate that they were any different than we are, except for one thing, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit completely took over, and guided their lives. So if you're like me, if you've been trying to change your life for years, my recommendation to you is to quit trying. You're not going to do it. I don't care how many self-help books you buy. I don't care how many times you go to Christian bookstores and find books on how to be a better Christian or how to pray better. The only thing that's really going to change you is the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life and your willingness to surrender to the Holy Spirit. Because after a while, it becomes clear to all of us that we can't change. The only thing that can change us is God himself. And God has chosen to do that by sending his Spirit. We don't need to unlearn bad habits. We don't need to be a little more disciplined or a little more accountable. We don't need... We don't need a better Bible reading plan. We need God's grace. We need God's grace and we need God's spirit and we need to have our hearts changed by his mighty, awesome power. We need to be filled with the spirit of Jesus Christ himself, just like those men and women were on the first Pentecost. So that each of us can say what Paul said in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So what keeps us from going from where we are to where we ought to be? What keeps us from totally surrendering to the, to the Holy Spirit? Remember, we are Christians. And by being Christians, it means we have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. So why are we not utilizing this gift? Why aren't we totally surrendering to this? I think many Christians are scared of what God might do if they totally surrender to the Holy Spirit. I can honestly say there was a time in my life when that was me. 
I didn't want to totally surrender because I had no clue what God would do. I read about these guys in the Bible whose whole life changed. They ended up moving somewhere else, going somewhere, leaving everything they knew behind, giving up all that was familiar to them. And I was a little afraid that if I surrendered the Holy Spirit, I was going to end up in Malali or someplace. I had no idea what God was going to do. And that held me back. And I can understand people who are concerned that if they totally give in to the Holy Spirit, um, they don't know where God's going to lead them. <coughs> and that, by the way, is the truth. When you give in to the Holy Spirit, you do not know where God will lead you. I can be honest with you. The giving in to the Holy Spirit, the fullness of the Holy Spirit, might well mean the loss of some comforts in your life. It might mean loss of some securities in your life. It might be an increase in persecution. You may lose some friends. It may bring trouble to you. You may have to give away some of your possessions. All of these things are things that will happen uh, to later, lesser or greater extent to all of you who fully give in to the Holy Spirit. You may have to give up some things you really enjoy. There is a cost. But I have to tell you there's a benefit too. There's a great benefit. It's a heavenly benefit. But there's also a great increase in joy in your, <coughs> excuse me, in your life. <clears throat> it is a happier life, a more joy-filled life to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to be doing the things the Holy Spirit calls you to do. I've probably told you before that happiness and comfort and joy are not necessarily things that all go together, especially the comfort part. Um, but happiness and joy are things that God brings to us as we serve him, you cannot be in the presence of God and not be joyful. But you can only have one or the other. You can't have both. That's the thing that Jesus teaches us over and over and over. You cannot serve two masters. You have to pick one that you're going to serve. For me, I would much rather be joyful and filled with the spirit of God than have all the comforts that I think I need so much. But I fight against it. I will confess to you that I fight against it. But I really want to live a life that pleases God and to live a life that the Holy Spirit is guiding. And isn't that what you really want too? Don't you really want deep down inside to be fully in the presence of God? To be fully there with God on the one hand we need to be willing to do whatever the Bible teaches even if it does seem extreme and some of the things the Bible teaches us to do are extreme and some of the things the Holy Spirit asks us to do are extreme on the other hand the Bible does it, the Bible itself does warn us against uh, dangerous extremes there are those who have taken this whole message of the Holy Spirit too far. Um, they have created a mystique around it that's not biblical. And that we need to avoid. But we cannot let the fear of those extremes keep us from doing the things that the Holy Spirit is calling us to do. The Holy Spirit will, in fact, have us do things that will glorify the name of God through Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit will, in fact, have us do things that are difficult and frightening and out of our comfort zone. But that, but that is something that leads to glory. It is, a, it, is a, it is a walk that will lead us and those around us into the presence of God. How do you go about being filled with the Holy Spirit? How does that happen? Well, it comes, as I said, when you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit takes resonance in you. 
But the Holy Spirit residing in you and you surrendering to the Holy Spirit are not quite the same thing as you probably already know. That whole business of, of being surrendered to the Holy Spirit comes primarily from prayer. It comes from us being totally committed and, and going to God and asking and seeking and knocking. Just like Jesus told us when he taught about prayer in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, we have to continually ask him. We have to continually seek. We have to continually knock. This is a big thing. Um, we have to be committed to doing this. We have to really desire in our heart to be uh, controlled by the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's a major step. And when we do that, when we begin to pray, when we come into God's presence in prayer and begin to ask him to control us, to ask him to show us the way of the, the Holy Spirit, to ask him to fulfill us, those things begin to come. We begin to see those things happen in our lives. I'm not saying that tongues of flame are going are gonna to come upon you like it did on that first day of Pentecost. There are some events in, in the history of God's working with man are, that are unrepeatable, and I think that might be one of them. But that doesn't mean that the same power that those men and women received on that first Pentecost can't be ours because it can be ours. What we have to decide is, do we want it to be ours? Are we genuinely, seriously, deep down in our hearts, committed to following God? Because if we are, then we need to seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Is it what I really want? Do I really want to be a Holy Spirit-filled and a Holy Spirit-led Christian? Do I really want to be a person who is filled with God? If we do, then God will answer that prayer. Jesus taught us that, that if you will pray in my name, I will answer. And this is a prayer that we can pray that, that is fully, completely, and entirely in the will of God. And if we're willing to seek him and to seek his presence in our life, he will take us there. He will do that. So I think we need to start praying. I think those of us, including myself, who are not fully controlled by the Holy Spirit need to continue to pray, to continue to search, continue to find the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life and continue to surrender when it's there. Stop fighting against it. We can't be distracted any longer. We can't be casual observers. We can't be couch potatoes of the Christian game. It's not a game. It's a way of life. Um, this is not a spectator sport. Christianity is a, is a means by which we glorify God with our very life. And he has given us the responsibility to glorify his name in a world that doesn't glorify his name. It's a difficult job, and we can't do it apart from the Holy Spirit. One more thing that we need to do is we need to study Scripture. The Bible in Acts doesn't explicitly say that that's one of the things these men and women were doing, but they were in the temple. They were meeting together every day, they were waiting for a promise from the Old Testament. Jesus told them, I will, I will do what the Old Testament prophets promised. Now, you have to assume that they're going to want to look that up and see what it was that the Old Testament promised. But I also know in my own life, in the lives of those who, who around me who I who I admire in the way that they live the Christian life, that it's not possible without the Holy Spirit and without the Holy Scriptures. 
God chooses almost always to talk to us through scripture. If you want to know what God is saying to you, then you have to open the Bible because that's where he's likely to say it. And that's where the Holy Spirit is likely to lead you when you're seeking wisdom. You know, it's interesting. The early church had none of the things that we consider so essential for success in the church today. They didn't have any buildings. They didn't have any money. They didn't have any political status or influence. They certainly had no social status. And yet, that early church won multitudes to Christ. They saw many churches established throughout the Roman world. And in a couple of hundred years, they completely overturned the entire religious uh, landscape of the Roman Empire. And it became Christian. Uneducated men, uneducated women, filled with the Holy Spirit and committed to sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why were they able to do that? Because the church had the power of the Holy Spirit. And this church can also have the power of the Holy Spirit. We need only seek it and genuinely desire it in our life and ask God to send it. Amen. Would you join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. With a little luck and uh, good fortune, this may be um, the beginning of something new. We may be able to start meeting in person again. I know we're going to try that next week and in the coming weeks. We'll see how it goes. We do ask you to be here next Sunday in person uh, if you feel comfortable, only if you feel comfortable. We are going to have a live service uh, uh, next Sunday at 9.30 here at the church. It will also be videotaped for those of you who are not comfortable um, uh, being here. We ask you to exercise uh, due diligence and caution and wear masks. Uh, we won't have a, a fellowship afterwards, uh, but uh, we do think it's important that we begin to meet together, that we begin to share communion together, that we begin to do the things that we have had to forego during this time. So that's going to start next week. Um, and again, if you feel comfortable being here, join us. If not, then we are still going to videotape the service and you can still partake uh, through the video. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and fill you with peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.